Good afternoon. It's uh, wonderful to have you here today with us. I've been reading a little bit more news than I should, and it sure gets confusing sometimes being in an election year with all the polit politicization of everything going on right now. It's hard to know what's true and what's not. You have to check your resources, double check them. I have learned not to put my hope in human beings, but to put my hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever is happening right now, what I desire, and I hope what you desire, is that God's will would be done, that whatever Jesus is purposing for and through this pandemic, that that would be accomplished. And that is word, as his word is going out now over the internet from so many pastors around the globe, there is more opportunity for people to hear the gospel now than ever before. So I just very much thank you for being here today. We're here to pray, so let's begin with prayer. Father, I just want to thank you for this day. And I thank you for good friends, for family, for the body of Christ, which is even closer than blood family. Water, or blood is thicker than water, but spirit is thicker than blood. Father, just I thank you for your presence with us. That we have become your temple. That our own lives, our inner beings, have become the Holy of Holies, from which you make your presence known on this earth. What an awesome opportunity and responsibility and privilege that we have to have very God living within us. Father, I'm as I pray this morning, I, I get the sense a praying for those who are trying to develop a cure, Lord, or at least a vaccine. I hear even so many conflicting reports about this, that one won't be found ever, that it'll take years to find, that it's going to be in July, that it's going to be not till yet next year. There's a cacophony of voices out there, Lord. And so oftentimes the cacophony of voices in that cacophony, in that din of voices. We don't know what motivates people for why they do things and why they say things. And so, Father, I just I pray that you would give us this spiritual discernment and understanding from your spirit. That you would speak truth into our being. What's important in all of this is that we keep our eyes focused on you. So whatever the case, I just pray for these researchers, Lord, for the scientists, for the epidemiologists, for those working so hard to find a cure or a treatment or a medication or a vaccine that will be effective in stopping this pandemic. We pray that you would give them spiritual wisdom and understanding, that you would give them answers that you would open up their minds to understand how this virus works and how it can be combated and even stopped, Lord. At the same time, our request, Lord, is that you would bring this pandemic quickly to an end, that you would restore economies, that you would comfort the, li the lives of all those who have lost loved ones around the planet. Father, I pray that you would help us not to grow cynical I look at the numbers every day and they just seem to be growing numbers, but these are individual people whose lives have been shattered, whose families' lives have been shattered by this pandemic. Father, I just pray for clarity, for wisdom, for discernment in how we should go about living. I pray for clarity, discernment, wisdom, spiritual wisdom, and understanding to know when to open our churches when to proceed, when to return to life as normal. I don't think there's going to be life as normal, Lord. You have, in a sense, blessed us with this pandemic in, in many regards, blessed us with 
getting the word out in, in a way that's never been done before. Thank you that our church has been able to move to live streaming and that we will not stop live streaming after this. <clears throat> I thank you that you have put families back together, that children are spending time with their mom and dad, that mom and dad are learning how difficult it is to train these children. And I pray that you would give them understanding hearts when at long last the children are able to return to school. Father, forgive us. We have inculcated, we have absorbed, we have swallowed whole this lie that rebellion is a value. We are a rebellious lot in our nation, Lord. It's infected all of us. We resist your Holy Spirit. We resist your truth. We certainly resist your law because no one can live under it. Help us to put away our rebellion, Lord, as a nation, as a people, as individuals, Lord. That rebellion in certain circumstances is valued, but we have turned it into one of our chief values, Lord. Your word says that rebellion is as witchcraft. It's a serious thing, Lord. We carry an attitude of pride and rebellion in our culture. Forgive us, Lord. Turn our hearts towards home. Turn our hearts towards you, because wherever you are, you are our home. And again, I lift up to scientists and researchers and epidemiologists that you would give them clear direction and that they would be able to find a solution to this. But beyond that, again, we pray, take this cup of this pandemic from us. Yet we don't want to get in the way of any work you're doing through it or by it. And so we pray, not our will, but yours be done. Your will be done, Lord. That's our heart's cry. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On this tired old planet. As it's being carried out in heaven. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, thank you for joining me today. Today is Thursday, so I won't be um, coming back tomorrow. We have an annual meeting on Sunday at 1 p.m., so I will be preparing for that. We have a long document that I prepare every year with the help of our ministry team leaders and so on. So I um, really have appreciated your spending time with us each week. We're cutting it down to two a week now, Wednesdays and Thursdays. And then starting next Thursday, we'll be doing our evening Bible study, the uh, Covenant Group Bible study, and we're on a Bible study called the Discipleship of Grace. It's one that I'm writing, but the group of people who gather with me have been helping to edit it and and question it and tailor it and tell me when I got it off or, or wrong, and we've been having a good time together. So we are on Unit 3 of this Discipleship of Grace, entitled The Descent of Man, and we're on a chapter from uh, Abraham to the Twelve Brothers. And so we're right in the middle of, of looking at the story of the Twelve Brothers, Jacob's sons. So I encourage you to come. It starts at 7 p.m. If you're interested, in, uh, you can Facebook message me, you can call me, or you can email me. We, I have lots of emails, and I will give you the link to it. Uh, we are going to have a join meeting. You have to wait in the waiting room to join because uh, churches have been getting getting hit with uh, they're getting hacked and then slammed with pornography during their meetings. So we're going to be very careful not to let that happen to us. So again, thanks for coming today. We're reading Psalm 27. I love this psalm. I have the first verse of it up, up on a picture on my, in my bathroom, so every day I see this. Um, 
Again, it's a Psalm of David. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers come upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemy enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing yes. I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your, do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my foes. Do not deliver me over to the desires of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have despaired unless I have had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. So again, we, we have this psalm, Psalm 27. It's a psalm of David, we're told. That's actually within the text. And as I studied this psalm, again, we come across another chiasmus. And this is a very long psalm, so I wanted to show you the whole chiasmus all at once. It's a little, going to be a little bit hard for you to read, but it's Psalm 27 is this chiastic structure where you have a parallelism going on between the first, of, the first lines and the last lines. And as you go into the psalm, there's this matching of each line with that progressive uh, step inward and a step outward from the middle. And always in a chiasmus, in a chiasm sometimes they're called, or a chiastic structure, it's that centermost point that is being emphasized. It's, it's what is important. I came across three different patterns for this chiastic structure. This is the one that made most sense to me that seems to line up the best. And so we're going to take a look at those pairs, and I'm going to blow it up. So you, we're going to go back to this, show you where the pairs are, and then blow up each pair so you can see them easier than on this um, rather overwhelming screen. But you'll see there is A, B, C, D, E, and then F is the center. So there's five pairs and then the center, F. And again, we begin, begin with A1, the Lord is my light and salvation, and A2 at the bottom, and I would have despaired unless I had believed. So let's take a look at that pairing. It says in Psalm 27, 1, Yahweh is my strength. That's kind of the heading. Uh, I will get to the end, and, and I, I actually reference where I'm getting this from, that structure. And these headings are from uh, a work, and I'll, I'll let you know when we get, get to the end of, of this. But Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? Again, David finds himself with an opposing enemy, likely an army or a group of people. It might be Saul. It might, some people think it's Absalom and the armies of Israel coming against David. We're not told. So I always say, don't speculate. Don't base what we believe about the Bible on speculation. 
I think a lot of times speculation is fascinating. We build understandings of text because of our speculation. And, and I'll tell you what, every time we build that understanding of the Bible based on our speculations, we are not understanding the Bible. We are putting something into the Bible. So here it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Light is something that, you know, when you're in a dark room and you turn on the light, you can see. In the same way, I remember going to the Carl, the Lewis and Clark Caverns in Montana about five or six years ago with my family. And we went deeply down into the cave. And then he asked everyone to cover their, their little luminary watches and or luminous watches. And he asked everyone to turn off their cell phones or to at least cover them up. And then he turned off the lights. There was uh, floodlights in, in the caverns. And he turned them off, and it was so dark, you couldn't see the hand in front of your face. And then he lit a single match. And that single match lit up the entire cavern. You could see the walls, you could see the stalactites. It was beautiful, that one little light. And here it is, the Lord is my light. Who is the Lord? Yahweh. And we know from our previous studies that that's certainly Jesus Christ. That Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, referencing this name the verbal form of, the, of this name. And so when he says, the Lord is my light, it illumines truth. The Lord is my light. So Jesus, Yahweh, illumines truth. He illumines my life. Having the light switch turned on our lives sometimes is, isn't all that fun. He reveals our sin to us. He reveals our twisted motives, our selfish motives. But the Lord is my light. In the Lord, I see truth. I see clarity. I can see with clarity. The Lord is my light and my salvation. And here, that Hebrew word salvation is the same name we get the name Jesus from. So there's this wonderful play on words here that probably, well, it was intended by the Holy Spirit. Yahweh is my salvation and we get Jesus, Yeshua, is, is based on this word salvation. When we get to the new covenant, we certainly understand that the Lord is our salvation. We'll be getting there. Whom shall I fear? If he's my light, if he brings clarity to my thinking, if he exposes my sin, if he leads me into all truth, and he is my salvation, he's going to deliver me from my enemies. That's the context that word salvation always has so many words in, the, in, in both the Hebrew and Greek languages have a literal meaning and then they have figurative meanings. And oftentimes we go right to the figurative, but here he's talking primarily about his enemies and that the Lord is his deliverance, his salvation from his enemies. But it can also certainly spill over into that figurative meaning when we're talking about salvation from death, from sin, from the devil, from our flesh, whom shall I fear? Sometimes the person I fear the most in my, in my life is myself. Because I know how fickle I am. And I suspect that you know how fickle you can be if you're really honest about it. The Lord is the defense of my life. So oftentimes we, we seek to be the defense of our own lives. We think it's up to us. And I love this. Jesus is the defense of my life. Jesus is the defense of your life. Whom shall I dread? I hear these words echoed in. If God is for us, then who can be against us? Such positive, positive declarations from David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? And then we see the counterpart in this chiasmus. In the last two verses, they don't always line up in the length of things. Sometimes they're very short, lined up with a very long segment. Psalm 27, verses 13 and 14 says, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. As David goes into battle or is potentially going into the to battle, he would have despaired because of his, of his enemy was formidable, especially it was Absalom and all the troops of Israel. Absalom had won over the hearts of the Israelites and then amassed the 
troops of Israel to come against David with his 600 or so men or 1,000 men. I don't remember the exact number. That may be the case. It could have been a foreign nation coming against them. We don't really know. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So he's not talking about eternal life here. He's talking about temporal life. If he, if he thought that he was going to go into battle and be killed, that's a despairing thought. Now he believed that the Lord would bring him through this battle. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. In the above section, he says, The Lord is my light, my salvation, whom shall I fear? And the heading given it is, Yahweh is my strength. And at the end we say, we see, be strong. The Lord is my defense, he's my strength of my life. And then that command to be strong and, and let your heart take courage. This is a command that we see going all the way back into Deuteronomy. Be strong and courageous. Joshua commands the Israelites to be strong and courageous right before they enter the promised land and start having to do battles with those idolatrous nations. So the, the outer parentheses of this psalm is find your strength in God and then be strong by waiting on the Lord. That's something we're not good at. We, we're not good at waiting on the Lord. I love those verses in Isaiah chapter 40 at the very end of the chapter where it says, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength, literally will re exchange their strength. They will mount up or they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. If we wait on the Lord and exchange our weakness for his strength. We move on to in the chiasmus to be one and be two. You'll see that structure there. When evildoers come upon me to devour my flesh and do not deliver me over to the desires of my adversary. So we see this focus on the enemy. Let's take a look closer look at that. Psalm 27 verses 2 and 3. When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. The interesting thing about those words there is the, the tense of the verb actually suggests that this is yet to be future, and yet David is counting it as past. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. So now he's getting it, that this host is, is camping around him. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. Such words of confidence run through these first six verses of Psalm 27. You notice that change. I changed the background because there's this complete change of tone starting in verse 7. We'll see that coming up. And in verse 20, or chapter 27, Psalm 27, verse 12, my, do not deliver me over to the desire of my adversaries, this is a request, for false witnesses have risen against me and such as breathe out violence. So why is, if, if David is king, why is he worried about false witnesses? Because those witnesses may very well be going to God and saying, David did this, or David is accused of this. And those false witnesses are, at least if this is Absalom, going to the nation of Israel, in line to Israel about David. In our day, our adversaries aren't so pronounced. Yeah, we have adversaries, especially if you're in the military. You have truly enemy enemies who are trying to take your life and work against you and undermine our nation and destroy our nation. But in our sense, our, our enemies are unseen enemies. Right now, this pandemic, this little virus is our enemy. I love that prayer. Do not deliver me over to the desires of my adversaries. Do not deliver me over to the desires of Satan and his cohorts. For false witnesses have arisen against us, the accuser of the brethren, and such as breathe out violence. Again, you'll see on the Upper section, verses 2 and 3, the heading given, my adversaries. Verse 12, you can see clearly it's my adversaries, so you see the parallel, parallelism between these two texts. And then moving further into the psalm, we see C1. One thing I've asked 
from the Lord that I, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord and see to teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my foes. So there's this request in, in both sections, the, these parallel uh, sections of the chiasmus of Psalm 24 or Psalm 27. Sometimes I get mixed up. Yesterday I said Psalm 10 and it was Psalm 26. Such is my mind. Psalm 27, 4 reads, One thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. And because of that word temple there, some people put this then later in the life of Judah, near the end of the era of, or the reign of Judah, that, that the southern country which collapsed and was taken into exile in 586 B.C., but that tent that had been erected in Jerusalem for the Ark of the Covenant, it wasn't the original tent of meeting as I explained yesterday, but it was a tent where they have an altar and a laver and they had the table of showbread inside of it and so on. That was called the temple sometimes. And later on, you'll see that he talks about this tent. So he's not talking about a physical built, hard structure temple built with stone and mortar. He's talking about this tent. And what's the one thing he asked? That he can dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life. Well, it's interesting. He would only be allowed to approach the altar. He would not be able to go into the holy place and certainly not into the holy of holies. And so he's asking to be near the presence of the Lord is really what he's getting at. He wants to dwell with the Lord. To dwell in his house is to dwell in the presence of the Lord. And to behold the beauty of the Lord. We don't often think about that. We, we know that Jesus was marred beyond all recognition. That men, according to Isaiah, men turned away from him. But when you get down to it, Jesus is the most beautiful person you'll ever meet. The most beautiful thing, if, if I can even say that, you will ever see. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. We behold the beauty of Jesus on the cross where he forgives those who are railing against him, where he takes care of his mother, where he bears the sin of the world, the entire sin of the entire world from the beginning of time of Adam and Eve until the last day, that day of judgment. So much so that the father turns his face from Jesus. Lama, Lama, Sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then to see him give up his breath, to cry out, it is finished. The debt is paid in full. The just demands of the law have been met. The battle is won. It is finished. What kindness, what beauty we see in the face of the Lord. And so he's, if you'll see in, in the first section of that, he's, one thing I have asked, and then from the Lord, that I shall seek. And so the work I've been using says, I ask, I seek. And then below, in the counterpart in this chiasmus, Psalm 27, 11 says, Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path. So in the upper section, he's asking to see the Lord, to dwell in his house forever, to, to look on and behold his beauty, to see his beauty. He's asking and seeking. Below, he's also asking and seeking to be taught and to be led of the Lord. What marvelous prayer right there. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my foes, because of my enemies. We move on in the psalm that was C1 and C2. We come to D1 and D2. You'll notice that D1 is quite long and D2 is quite short, but you'll see why they're, they're paired up. Let's take a look at the closer look at them. Psalm 27, verses 5 through 6a. Remember, there was no versification in the original works of the Bible, whether in Greek or Hebrew. That was added much, much later. The versification as we know it in the Greek, in the New Testament, came about um, from Erasmus 
Oh, actually, it was um, Stephanus who created the Texas, who actually edited the Texas Receptus, one of the Greek New Testament translations that had been printed, one of the, those first translations of the Greek or the New Testament in Greek. It wasn't a translation, but that copy, he's the one who introduced versification. So that doesn't mean anything, the 5 to 6a. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me on a rock, and now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. It reminds me of him fleeing from Saul and hiding or getting bread in, uh, from the priest and then going up into the mountains and hiding out when he looks down and he sees uh, Saul encamped below him. And then Saul actually enters the cave to relieve himself. And David had a chance to kill Saul, but knew that it wasn't his place to do that. For in the day of trouble, Yahweh will conceal me in his tabernacle, in his house. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock, which is a Jewish Hebrew idiom for saying he will be victorious over his enemies. He will be lifted above them. And now my head will be lifted above my enemies around me. Again, that my head will be lifted up means that he will be victorious. He's looking to God to give him this victory. Still this very, very positive sense. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. And then Psalm 27.10 says, For my father and my mother have forsaken me. It would appear that his father and mother at this point had died. And so that's why they have forsaken him in that sense. He's using this poetic language. Sometimes, certainly after my mother died of cancer, it felt like she had forsaken us. Even though that was not her will or her intent, that's how it felt to us. There's no evidence that they had turn their backs on David at any time. This is likely a way of poetically describing their death. But the Lord will take me up. So up above you have, and now my heads will be lifted up, and I will be lifted up on a rock, and here the Lord will take me up. And so he's the lifter of our heads. He's the lifter of our souls out of trouble. He is the one who lifts us out of the harsh circumstances in life. He is the one who will lift us out of this pandemic. And again, you'll see in Psalm 27, the heading 5 and 6a, those verses, that work I'm using says, He will lift me up. And in Psalm 27, 10, Yahweh will take me up. You see that parallel thought going on in, in the chiasmus. Then we return to that overall structure. We're getting near the middle now. E1 and E2, and I will offer up in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. And E2 says, do not hide your face from me. Do not turn uh, your servant away in anger. They, they don't sound too much alike, but let's take a look closer look. Psalm 27, 6b to verse 7 has three positive peti petitions in it. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. And this is upon the completion of the battle. The battle hasn't happened yet. He's encamped around by his enemies. But he says, when you give me victory, Lord, I will sing praises in your tent. Again, that tent of meeting, except for not the original one, but the one he had erected in Jerusalem. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. And then here comes these three petitions, these three re requests of David, these three prayers, if you will. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. So he's asking to be heard. Two, and be gracious to me. Show your favor to me. Give me your grace. And three, and answer me. Hear my prayers. Then we jump down to 27.9. We have three negative petitions, and so we have three petitions, three requests, and three negative petitions, which means don't do this, and don't do that, and don't do this third thing. And so the first one is, do not hide your face from me. And that goes in line with, hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. If God hides his face from him, or turns his face from him, to hide your face is to mean that God is turned, turned in such a way that he's not going to hear David. 
And so David cries out, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Do not hide your face from me. Hear me. And then the second negative petition, Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. The second one is be gracious to me. And so these, these are counterparts. To be gracious is to be fully turned towards da David, to be giving David his attention and his grace, the power of his grace, to see him through this battle. And the counterpart is don't turn your, your servant away in anger. Don't turn your servant away in anger which is the opposite of giving him grace, of being gracious to him. And he reminds God, you've been my help in the past. Hebrew people always found hope, never by looking forward into the future, because all we see is the what-ifs of the horrible circumstances ahead of us. What if this further destroys our economy? What if this goes on for years? What if, what if, what if, and we can make ourselves sick? They looked back to the past and remembered those times when God was faithful in the past. And I have lots of those times in my life that I can be reminded of. So I like this. He reminds God that, you remember you were gracious to me in the past. You're going to be gracious to me again. And be gracious to me and do not turn your servant away in anger. And then the third negative petition is, do not abandon me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. The counterpart of that is, answer me, hear my prayer. If God abandons him and forsakes him, he certainly isn't hearing God, uh, David's prayer. And then again, he reminds me, him, O oh God of my salvation, you are the one who delivers me. You are the one who will deliver me from this battle against my enemies. This host encamped around me. Host meant a very, very large group. A very, very large formation of troops were encamped around David. Do not abandon me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. Answer me. So you have three positive pet petitions and three negative petitions. I've departed a little bit from the work I was using because they have the next, that third petition on the upper section actually in that center place. And I think this actually fits a lot better than what they did. So I'm departing on that one place from them. So now we get back to the chiasmus, this beautiful structure. I love Hebrew poetry. Look at what the Holy Spirit has done, how wonderfully crafted he's made his word. And then we get to F, which is, it's not a couplet. It's not a bicola. It's one, one line. Well, maybe it is a bicola, but it's the, that couplet of, of two lines that feed each other. And you get the completion of, or the complete idea out of both sides. Let's take a look, a closer look at that. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. So there is that couplet there. It begins with, God has told David in the midst of this battle, seek my face. So oftentimes in the middle of our battles, Jesus is simply saying, seek my face. In this battle with cancer I'm having, I start looking around me at the if onlys, if only I had gone to a different doctor, if only I had been more aggressive, and then all of the what ifs, what if this happens, or what if that happens, I can literally drive myself crazy. As I've said before, I've, I have, I've asked the Lord, why is this happening? to me. And he has whispered in my spirit that still small, sweet voice of the Lord. Grant, I love you. Just trust me. Again, a couple months later, I ask again, Lord, why, why are, is all this happening? Why, why are you allowing this? And again, his still sweet voice in my spirit. Grant, I love you. Just trust me. Sometimes we don't need to know what's ahead. He's just asking us to seek his face, to seek his beauty, to seek who he is in his character, to seek the wonder of who Jesus is, the wonder of the love of God, the wonder of life in his spirit. This is the heart of this psalm. 
is to see God's face. I love in John 14, I think it's 7, when Jesus says, Have you been with me so long you, you don't know the Father? When you see, have seen me, you have seen the Father. In the mystery of the Trinity, Jesus is saying that I am an exact representation of the Father. When you see my nature, when you see my character, when you see what I'm going to do for you on the cross, you've seen the heart of the Father. You've seen the Father. So get this, when we see Jesus, we're seeing God the Father in the mystery of the Trinity. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, and that's his inner being, not his emotions. Hebrew people always thought of heart. It was literally their kidneys, thought to be the seat of their, and their heart, those two areas were thought to be the seat of their thinking. My heart said to you, your face, O Lord, your face, O Yahweh, and unbeknownst to David, but it's your face, O Jesus, I shall seek. Even this, I need strength. I need help from the Lord to do this. I can't do it in of myself. Neither can you. Remember that verse I quoted yesterday? I am the vine, you are the branches. That means a branch has to be in the vine to get the vine life coming through it. If you get separated from the, from the vine, then that branch just dies. It shrivels up and dies. Our life shrivels up when we rely on ourself for life. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him. Do you hear that? This was unheard of prior to Jesus coming on the scene. That we would become the temple of the living God. That we would be made up of spiritual stones. And that we ourselves, our lives, would become the holy of holies. Your face, O Lord, I shall seek to be in the presence of the Lord. That's what he's saying. To see one's face. You know, I love to sit with Nancy. We haven't been able to do this in a while, but we had a date night every Friday night. And we'd go out to a restaurant and have a meal together and sit face to face and just talk. Oh, how I love her. I miss those times. We still go for walks and we still try to have our date night, but it's usually sitting down to watch a movie or something or play a game or make a puzzle. I've been really busy, so I haven't had as much time since the pandemic began. I'm busier now than I was before. But to seek my wife's face is to seek her presence, is to seek her company, is to seek her loving presence. To seek the Lord's face is to seek his presence, his company, His loving presence. Your face, O Jesus, I shall seek. And the beauty of that verse, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, that we are that holy of holies. He it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. So even the seeking of the Lord's face, I'm dependent on God. I was on a, a Thrive Theology uh, Zoom meeting on Monday or Tuesday evening. They invited me. Don't know why, but they invited me, and it happened to be on prayer. And even in prayer, I need His Spirit. So oftentimes we, re we rely on ourselves for things we don't need to rely on ourselves in. I can pray for His Spirit at any time. And e even in my seeking the Lord, I can pray for His Spirit to pervade, to fill my life, that I may seek the Lord out of the power of the Holy Spirit. We learn to grow in our dependence upon the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. There's never a time that you cannot ask the Holy Spirit to fill your life. I love those words in Luke 11 that says, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, we're not going to give them a snake if they ask for a loaf of bread, that, that whole passage. If you who are evil, you and I, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Keep asking, you'll receive. Keep seeking and you will find. 
keep knocking and the door will be answered to you. That isn't for all of our requests. And, you know, one time we wore God down with asking for a, uh, a van. We got a van. What that is getting at, we keep asking for the Holy Spirit. We keep seeking the Holy Spirit. We keep knocking that the door that the doors that the Holy Spirit desired to be open will be open to us. How much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So even in my seeking the Lord, even in my seeking Jesus and the Father, I can pray for the infilling of the Spirit so that I can seek Him out of spiritual strength and not out of fleshly strength. We so struggle because we seek Him out of our own abilities, out of our own capacities, not realizing that in Romans it says, no one seeks me, no one understands. But what beauty in this centerpiece in the chiasmus. Your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Your face, O Jesus, I shall seek. In the midst of this pandemic, where are we setting our eyes? On politics? On conspiracy theories? On which side is telling the truth? In all the different sides. On my own means to get me through? We need to be wise. Don't get me wrong. But I find peace when I'm seeking the Lord's face. When I'm seeking the Lord's presence. Not as a should. Not as a duty. Not as an obligation. But as a privilege. As an opportunity. To be with the Lord at all times. I want to dwell in his house. At all times. And it turns out that now. We have become his house. And so we are with him always. Right now. He is with you, and he promises you that he will never leave you nor forsake you if you have entrusted your life to him, if you have believed, if you have been persuaded that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, deity in the flesh, God in the flesh. So I told you the, the work I was reading. It's Psalms, Form, and Structure. It's kind of a hard title for me to remember. Psalms, Form, and Structure is the name of the book. And we have different contributors to it. David Whithoff, Chris Lyle, Matt Nerd, Nerddahl, Jimmy Parks, Elliot Ritzema, and the editor is Eli Evans. I just wanted to say thank you to them because they've done a marvelous job in this. It's kind of a technical work, but it gives a clear pictorial view of the structure of everything in the Psalms, of all the Psalms. So I, I've been leaning heavily on this work and on some other works as well. But they're responsible for the title, and they're responsible for that chiastic structure. This whole structure comes from them. So as I, as I thought about these words, especially this, these two sections, my adversaries, and how does this apply in the New Covenant? Certainly my light and my salvation, that applies to Jesus. I think, again, we can apply this psalm to Jesus himself, that He's the one who's encamped about. False witnesses are, are against him. You can read it through those eyes, so I'd encourage you to do that on your own. Later on, read this as if these are Jesus' words. But you have those ver verses again in Psalm 27, verses 2 and 3, and then verse 12 again. When evildoers come upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. Do not deliver me over to the desires of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. So I think about this in our lives, in your life, in my life. We don't have, unless you're in the military, some of you are, and this would be very apropos for you. This is what you are sometimes facing. But for those of us here... We do have a very real and formidable enemy. According to scripture, he's been de-armed. He's been, all of his, arm, his arms, his weapons have been taken away. All he's left with is ability, his ability to deceive us. 
So I, I wanted to take a New Covenant kind of look at this by reading Ephesians 6, 10 through 24. You'll see a lot of the same kind of be strong and courageous language in this. And I think these words take Psalm 27 and apply it directly to us in the midst of this pandemic, but also in the midst of the spiritual attack. For the last five or six years, I've been focusing on evangelism, learning how to do it, praying for the gift of evangelism. And I'm learning a lot about it and, and how to proceed with prayer, prayer and evangelism. But I'll tell you this, when you start setting your, your interests and your activity on evangelism, you're going to get a huge target painted on your back. So Ephesians 6, 10 through 24, reading again from the New American Standard Bible. Finally, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. Notice what it doesn't say. Finally, be strong in yourself and in the strength of your might. It doesn't say that at all. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything is coming from ourselves. Our adequacy is from God. Finally, be strong in the Lord. And again, that word Lord is, is borrowing on the use of Lord from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. Anytime they came across the name Yahweh, they would read Adonai, or in the Greek Septuagint, they would read Kyrios, the word for Lord, so as not to profane this forever name of God, this holy name of God. So this is talking about Jesus, Yahweh. Finally, be strong in the Lord, in Jesus, and in the strength of his might, in the strength of his power. We have this treasure of the ministry of the Spirit. We have this treasure of the risen Christ in earthen vessels, sometimes in cracked pots, to show that this transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. Be strong, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So oftentimes I've looked to myself, I've looked to my own strength, my own ability, my own effort, my own striving. This is a command here to us to be strong in the strength of God's power. And that word there is the word we get dynamite from. It's incredible power, the power that created the universe, the power that raised Jesus from the dead. And then a further command, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand against the schemes, against the methods, against the plan of, of attack of the devil. So he's not just passive in our lives as Christians. One of the first things he's trying to do is rob you of your witness, just as he soiled David's witness, as we saw yesterday, with, it, with the Bathsheba-Uriah debacle. He, he takes ministers out by getting them to fall, by soil, soiling their witness. And it's so easy. We get, we get hung up on our own pride and our ego, thinking, man, we're God's gift to the world, and that pride leads us into falls. Sounds scriptural, doesn't it? Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the, the methodologies, the schemes of the devil. That tells us that he has a purpose plan of attack on the church. He has a purpose plan of attack on your family. He has a purpose plan of attack on your life as a Christian. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Now he's clearing it up. Our enemies aren't, unless you're in the military, which then you have real enemies and you have to, you have to do your job and take care of those enemies. It's a difficult job. Not one I've had to do. I can't imagine what it's like, the pain of it. Thank you for those of you who are doing that on our behalf. But the real struggle, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. The real enemy is not other human beings, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so you'll see a hierarchy here. It begins with just rulers. They seem to be territorial rulers against the powers, and you, you, you're going up a notch. 
against the world forces. Now we're talking about demonic forces that rule whole parts of the world and then against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places to the top echelon. Some people have tried to figure out the organization of Satan's army out of this, these verses. I don't think that's what it's telling us. It's telling us there are these distinct levels of authority within Satan's kingdom. But what it's telling us is that his army is organized and well stratified under the command of Satan in this attack on us. It's well thought out. Sometimes I, I wonder if, if I've contracted cancer because of moving in closer and closer to being evangelistic and to sharing the gospel. So the enemy is trying to take me out. I know in AA, sometimes I've spoken and there are people who are into witchcraft and they will counter me. As soon as I talk, they step in and counter what I've said. And I wonder what they've, well, maybe that's getting conspiratorial. No, this battle is real. So if you hear this, there is a coordinated attack carried out by a well-organized army against you. And so, can you imagine standing in your own strength against this army encamped around you, this host of demonic forces encamped around us in this world? We know that the whole world is under the power of the evil one, but we are children of God. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. He's not asking you to go on the offense here. He's, this is defensive, to stand firm, take up the armor and to stand firm. There is one offensive weapon we'll see. And then what's this armor? Let me just remind you, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might in this battle against this spiritual enemy that we face. I face this every week, Saturday night, Friday night. I start getting attacked in my mind. He brings back old memories. He accuses me. He says, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, he just papers, wallpapers my life with lies. And I resist them, resist him and his cohorts, surrender to God. And then he flees. But the attack is very real in my life. And then we get to the armor. Stand firm, therefore, having your girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So I've, I've heard really strange things about this. Uh, taking up the armor is... You know, I put on, you, you do it by faith, I put on truth right now. And I'm now, by faith, putting on the breastplate of righteousness. That's not what this is getting at. When it says, having girded your loins with truth. The verse right before this says, Therefore, take up the full armor of God. Having girded your loins with truth. And so we're talking about the truth of the gospel, the truth that we find in the new covenant that we are redeemed, that we are saved, that we are forgiven. But ironically, it says in John 14, 6, Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way and the truth. And so Jesus is this piece of armor. He in himself is the truth. And so knowing him, knowing his kind heart, seeking his face, is putting on this armor. In fact, he is the armor, this piece of armor. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, that's to present your vital organs, this breastplate of righteousness. When we fall into sin, and especially habitual sin, we're not wearing this breastplate of righteousness. So it seems like, you know, get out of your bad behavior. But none of us can do that in of ourselves. We can approach God the Father and ask the Holy Spirit would put to death these things in our life that are gripping our life. But again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 I read, He is a source of your life in Christ Jesus. God is a source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness, and our, sanct 
our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So Jesus is our righteousness. He is our breastplate of righteousness. So we put this on by drawing in close to Jesus and knowing that Jesus is my shield. He is my righteousness. He is my breastplate who's going to keep my vital organs going, who's going to keep me from this attack of the enemy who's trying to take my life. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Again, it's knowing the gospel, getting to know it inside and out, memorizing verses that for God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Knowing that gospels inside and out. But again, in Ephesians 2, 13 and 14, we read, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, meaning the Gentiles, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups, the Jews and Gentiles, into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, which was the law. For he himself is our peace. Jesus is our peace. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, this, this piece of the armor is Jesus himself. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So oftentimes we, we abandon faith to look with our eyes at the circumstances around us and the circumstances of our health and the circumstances of the pandemic. And we're not trusting him. We're not having faith. And yet I read again in Philippians, this is from the King James, they get it right. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. And the righteousness which is of God by faith. So that second faith is, is the faith that we've been given. That first faith, we put our trust in the faith of Christ. It took tremendous faith, living as a perfect human being, for him to go to the cross. For him to endure the 39 lashes. To him in, to, in, to endure the slapping and the spitting and the being beaten with rods. And for the one through whom all things were created and the one in whom all things are held together for him to endure, be nailed to the cross. That took tremendous faith on the part of Jesus. And then in that last moment when he cries out, it is finished and he bows his head and he gives up his spirit. He willingly gives up his life. No one takes his life from him. He lays it down on his own initiative. He gives up his spirit. He willingly gives himself over to death. What faith did that take on Jesus' part? My faith is in the dependability of Jesus, in his faithfulness, in his faithfulness to keep his promises. And in the end, it's measured to us. Romans says, Romans 12, 3 says, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, which is our tendency as Americans, but to think so to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. So even the faith that is ours is allotted to us. It's, a, it's measured to us by God. Or again in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And this, both the grace and the faith and everything that has come before that this is in a grammatical form that it's not referring to one thing in that list, but to everything, including the faith. So it says, but by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of your own doing, it is a gift of God. So even our faith is a gift of God. Don't try to figure it out. Just be thankful. Thank you for giving me this measure of faith that you've allotted to me, Lord. And in the end, Jesus himself is our faith. And take up the helmet of salvation. One of my good friends, Paul Haworth, always says, you know, we take up the helmet of salvation and we st stand butt naked out in the street with our helmet on and we're good to go. We're good, to, good, good for the fight. Well, you need the full armor of God to stand against this enemy. What does it mean to take up the helmet of salvation? What does a helmet protect? It, it protects your head, your brain, your thought life, your thinking. And I think that one of the enemy's formidable attacks on the church and on Christians is to get you to doubt your salvation. Whole churches have set their theology based on this lie that you're not really saved, that you're not saved eternally. 
Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He's already got it the moment you believe and does not come into judgment, but has, has passed, has already passed. It's a beautiful, perfect tense verb that the action has been completed. We've been, we passed from death into life. And now we're living in the eternal benefits of that completed action of having passed from death to life. And so this helmet of salvation is knowing that you're saved because the enemy is going to get you to question it. You really blow it sometime. Maybe I get ticked at my wife or have an argument with a friend and I think, man, what? why did I go there? What? And then the enemy comes in and goes, what kind of Christian are you? I don't know if you're even saved. Well, we're to take up the helmet of our, of our salvation. But again, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, it says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that salvation is through Jesus. Or again, in 2 Timothy 2, 10, For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. So Paul is about being an apostle to bring this message of the grace of Jesus, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the promise of eternal life. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes have, has eternal life. Truly, truly, I say to you, she who believes has eternal life. The salvation which is in Christ Jesus the Lord. So even the salvation, this helmet of salvation, is what Jesus has done himself. For us, it's not something that you do. And in the sword of the Spirit, which is, is the Word of God. And yet, in the beginning of John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so that written Word always is meant to lead us to the living Word, to reveal Jesus to us. So herein you see that in the end, it's Jesus himself. It's Yahweh. He is our armor. And you put him on by looking to him, by focusing on him. You can't create righteousness in, your, in yourself. You can't think yourself into truth. We certainly can read the Bible, but even that we need that indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit illuminating our understanding. We look to Jesus. And so now we go back to our psalm. Oh, a little bit more. We're going to skip that. You can read that later, uh, verses 18 through 20. Psalm 27, verse 8. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, O Lord, or your face, O Lord, I shall seek. That's putting on the armor of God, keeping our focus riveted on Jesus Christ. What words for this pandemic? I try to stay away from listening to the news because it gets my focus on the wrong things. I do look at the numbers and look at a vi variety of resources for the numbers to make sure I'm getting accurate numbers to see if this is getting better or not because it, it makes a difference for when we open our church. But in the midst of this, the call is, Your face, O Lord, we shall seek. To seek that tender, loving presence of Jesus in our lives, to remember that he is the truth, that he is our righteousness, that he himself is our peace, that it's his faith, his dependability in which I put my trust, his faithfulness to keep his promises, and he himself is our salvation by what he did on the cross. And lastly, he is the one who brings me, who fights my battles because he is the word of God. Jesus said, my words, they are spirit and they are life. So if you get anything out of this talk today, aside from knowing that Jesus is your armor, how do you put on that armor? Your face, O Lord, I shall seek. And even in this, Fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I will be seeking you out of your strength and not mine. Your face, O Lord. Your face, O Yahweh. 
your face, O Jesus, I shall seek. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining me today. I really appreciate the time you take out of your day to spend with me. I have no time limit on, on when I do these things. I, I talk until I'm done. Hopefully, I talk until the Holy Spirit is done. That's better. Uh, let's close in prayer. Father, again, I just thank you for this psalm. That you are my light, you are our light, and you are our salvation. And Father, help us to seek your face. Give us the power by your Holy Spirit. Strengthen us in our inner being by the power of the Holy Spirit so that Christ may dwell in our heart through faith and that we, being rooted and grounded in love, that love that we see in the face of Jesus on the cross, that we would know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that we might be filled up with the fullness of God. We pray for spiritual power for three things, Lord that you might dwell in our heart through our trusting you, that you would open up to us the immeasurable boundaries, the boundaryless boundaries of the love of Christ, which goes beyond what we can even know of it, and that you would empower us through the Holy Spirit in our being so that we may be filled up with the fullness of God. We give you praise for David, Lord, for penning those words which also apply to our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, each one of us, to take up the full armor of God, to be strong in your strength, not in our own, to look to you, to keep our eyes riveted on you. And when our eyes stray and wander, Lord, you bring us back to that tender place, to that gentle place of being in your presence, of seeking your face. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, thank you for coming. I won't be back tomorrow. I'm going to be preparing for our annual meeting. We will be back on Sunday at 11 a.m. for my final uh, sermon on our 2 Corinthians series. So I hope you can join me for that at, at 11. And then again at 1 p.m. on that same day, we'll be having our church's annual congregational business meeting. Once again, thank you for taking the time out of your day. Our Benediction, our blessing, is found in the continuation of the prayer I prayed out of Ephesians. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. To him be the glory. To you, Lord, be the glory. Amen.